Life is hell. But at least there are prizes. Or so one thought. One knew of the pit ahead, of the grown-ups lying there, rewarded, arranged, and faded, who were so long ago bright as poppies. One learned to take one's own deserved place on the edge, ready to leap, not to hang back in a status-free huddle where bodies were worn together and the future darkness seemed less frightening. Therefore, one learned to win prizes, to be surrounded in sleep by a dream of ordinal numbers, to stand in best clothes upon platforms in order to receive medals threaded upon black and gold ribbons, books bound in calf, scrolled certificates. One's face became, from habit, incandescent with achievement. I had my share of prizes and of resentment when nobody recognised my efforts. For instance, year after year, when the New Zealand Agricultural and Pastoral Society held its show in the Onui Drill Hall, I made a buttonhole of a rose and a sprig of maidenhair fern tied together with raffia, which I entered for the flower display gentleman's buttonhole. It was never displayed, and it never won a prize. One morning, a militant woman in a white coat made a speech to the whole school from the front steps before Bertie Dowling played the kettle drum for us to march inside, and in her speech, the woman accused too many people of entering for the buttonhole section and advised us not to try to make buttonholes, as they were an art beyond our years that even grown-ups found difficult to master. "'It has never been explained,' the woman said." Why so many children enter buttonholes in the flower show? Bertie Dowling had the sticks raised, ready to play the drum. Oh, he was very clever at it. He was a small, sunburned, wiry boy with long feet like a rabbit. I felt antagonistic towards the woman visitor. Who was she to order me not to make buttonholes for the flower show? I persisted, as I say, year after year, yet always... Once I had surrendered my exhibit neat in its little box, cadged from the jewellers, I never heard of it again. I had so much determination and so little wisdom that I never grasped the futility of my struggle, although I realised that when talents were being devised and distributed, my name was not included in the short list of those blessed with the power to make gentlemen's buttonholes that would reach the display table at the flower show in the drill hall and win first, second or third prize. I won six and four pence for handwriting. At that time, I was in love with my parents, therefore I decided to buy my mother a best china cup, saucer and plate with the entire six and four pence, even though at that time I also had a fondness for Santa chocolate bars, jelly beans and chocolate fish whose insides were a splurge of pink rubbery substance with tiny air holes in it. When I gave my mother the best china cup, saucer and plate, she said, You shouldn't have and wrapping the set carefully in tissue paper, she placed it in the sideboard cupboard with the other dishes that we never used, not even for the banquet to see the new year in, like the gravy boat, the tiny cream jug with a picture of a Dutch girl, the vegetable dishes with a picture of a rooster crowing on each one. Then my mother locked the door. I never saw her using the cup, saucer and plate. It was best china, too, the man in Peaks told me. My mother always said she was keeping the set for when she could really use it, drinking out of the cup, resting a silver spoon in the saucer, tasting with a cake fork a slice of marble cake upon the plate. Although I could not then discern the difference between using something and really using it, there was evidently a distinction so important that when my mother died, she had still not been able to use, really to use, my sixpence and fourpenny gift to her. My next prize was for a poem that revealed both my lack of scientific knowledge and my touching disbelief in change, by concluding with the lines, And till the sky falls from above, these things of nature I shall love. Uncle Ted, of my favourite wireless station in Christchurch, 
read my poem over the air between a recording of the Nutcracker Waltz of the Flowers and the fifth episode of David and Dawn in Fairyland. And two days later, I received through the post an order for 10 shillings, with part of which I bought for myself an unsatisfactory diary and a John Bull printing set, which I used printing my name and rude rhymes and insults to the rest of my family until the ink dried on the navy blue pad. The remainder of the ten shillings I saved in a post office bank, which could not be opened unless it was taken to the post office. I broke into it with a kitchen knife when my bathing cap perished and the weather was warm enough for swimming. Prizes. They arrived unexpectedly, or I waited greedily for them at the end of every school year when I received one or two, sometimes three books, with a school motto, Pleasure from work, inscribed on the flyleaf beneath the cramped, detailed writing of the form mistress, setting out the reasons for my prize. Reasons were necessary, for no school had yet learned to distribute prizes at random. First come, first served, in the manner that my mother had adopted, in exasperation, when she was pestered for raisins, dates, or the last of the chocolate biscuits. I collected so many books. Treasure Island, Silas Marner, Emma, Poems of Longfellow, with a heart-throbbing picture of Hiawatha bearing Minnehaha across the river. Over wide and rushing rivers, in his arms he bore the maiden. India, with illustrations coloured as earth with cochineal, boys and girls who became famous, and during the war when books were scarce, a musty old rained on and stained volume of poems about blossoms, barns and wine presses printed in tall dark type where snakes lured in every capital letter. Prizes. <laughs> Some did not get prizes. Dotty Baker with the greasy hair never got a prize. Maud Gray, who found it hard to read even simple sentences aloud, never got a prize. Maud Gray. She was the stodgiest girl in the class. All the teachers made fun of her and most of the pupils, including myself, followed their example. Her eyes were brittle and brown, like cracked acorn shells. Her face was pale and blotched, like milk on the turn. Years later, I was visiting Ennui. I was walking desolately in the rain along the main street, wearing my dirty old gabardine and my dowdy clothes, and feeling fifteen instead of twenty-five, when just beyond the bed of poppies, in the centre of the street, I saw two beautiful women wheeling prams, and their proud gait was so noticeable, I tried to recall when and where I had seen before that superior parading of the victorious, and then I realised that I had walked onto the platform in the same way year after year to receive my prizes. Dottie Baker, Maud Gray. As they passed with their cocooned, quilted, embroidered treasure, I could not even assert my superiority by whispering, You cheated in history. You couldn't learn poetry by heart. You never had your name in the paper, first in geometry, French, English, history. They smiled at me, and I smiled at them. We shared the pit, each in her place. The rain poured upon the bed of crushed poppies between us. Yet the delicacy and distance of the two women were unmistakable. I grudged their proud cloaks as they trooped clients of love on their specially reserved side of the world. But prizes? They never won prizes. My only retaliation was prizes, listing them, remembering. I wrote to a children's newspaper, sending poems that were awarded ten or five or three marks, when I had earned 100 marks, I received the usual prize of two guineas. For one guinea, my father bought me a tennis racket, as he said, on the cheap. But when he showed it to me, I was alarmed to discover that the strings were black instead of white. And the name was unfamiliar. 
double duke. I was the loneliest person in the world with my black stringed double duke. Why had my father not realised that every other girl at school possessed a white stringed vantage? Ugh, it was sad enough to have an old wireless at home with a name no one had ever heard of, and with tubes so few in number compared with the tubes in other sets. The conversations in class went, Have you got a wireless at home? How many tubes? The prestige of owning things mattered so much, and to have a tennis racket with a strange name and grotesque strings was punishment indeed. I was so ashamed of my tennis racket that I seldom used it. With my other guinea from the newspaper, I had the unexpected fortune to be chosen by Hesse Sutton, a woman up the road as her pupil for music lessons, the piano. At a reduced rate, and every Tuesday and Friday after school, I claimed an hour of Hesse Sutton's time in the front room of the house where she lived with her mother and a white parrot whose perpetual screaming inspired complaining letters to the evening paper. The front room was large and carpeted with sparkling, bubble-shaped windows. The piano made wonderfully clean sounds as the keys sank into and sprang from their green bedding. The sounds filled me with a polished sense of opulence and cleanliness, and each note emerged bravely and milkily alone and poured into me up to my neck. I swallowed I liked Hesse Sutton's piano. We had none at home. At my aunt's house, where I went to practice once a week, there was an old piano with soapy yellow keys that stuck halfway, and the lower or upper half of each sound had been weathered down so that each note came forth deprived, diseased, with an invalid petulance and stricture. Oh, but you must not bite your nails, Hesse Sutton warned me. Oh, you will never be able to play the piano if you bite your nails. That was my first intimation that Hesse Sutton was a spy. I clenched my fists, hiding my fingernails. At school, I said, I learn music, do you? Dottie Baker, Maud Gray, and others learned music, but mostly they were like uncooked pastry at it. They suffered a dearth of warmth expansion, gold finish. On the cold June days, when the music festival was held, we sat miserably in the hall, our coats over our knees, listening to a marche militaire being played by schoolgirl dentists and carpenters. My first piece was named Puck. I went down to the stationers to buy it on tick, and the ginger-haired boy served me, and his face had a rust-coloured blush, like a dock leaf in autumn, because he had to go to the small room at the back of the shop and ask his parents if it would be all right to serve me as our bill had not been paid. On my way home with Puck, I met Hesse Sutton and smiled at her, shyly and excitedly, but when she glanced at the parcel under my arm and the music half wrapped and gave an understanding smile, my face clouded in a fierce frown. How dare she see me and divine my excitement? How dare she? How I hated her! That afternoon, when I went for my lesson, she heightened my sense of shame. I saw you! She pounced as soon as I entered the room. I saw you! she said like a detective giving evidence. Coming home with your new piece of music. Oh, I guessed how excited you were. Well, I wasn't caring at all, I said suddenly. Yes, you were, Hesse Sutton insisted. I saw it in your face. I knew. I did not understand why she should appear so triumphant, as if by seizing on a momentary aspect of my behaviour, she had uncovered a life of deceit in me. Why, she honked with triumph, like the soldier who brought back the golden horn from the underworld as proof of the secret activities of the twelve dancing princesses. 
I did not realise that people's actions are mysteries that are so seldom solved. I knew, I knew, Hersey Sutton kept saying as I sat down to try out Puck. From that day, I no longer enjoyed my music lessons. I was weary of being spied upon. People were saying, observing me closely, Oh, she's filling out. Oh, she's growing tall. Look at her hair. Isn't that Grace's chin she's got? Oh, and there's no doubting where her smile comes from. You see how derivative I was made out to be. Nothing belonged to me, not even my body. And now with Hessie Sutton and her spying ways, I could not call my feelings my own. Why did people have so much need to stake their claim in other people? Were they scared of the bailiffs arriving in their own house? I stopped learning music. I was in despair. I could no longer use prizes as a fortress. In spite of my books bound in calf, my scrolled certificates the prize essay on the visit to the flour mill and my marks of merit in the children's newspaper, I was being invaded by people who wanted their prizes from me. And now I lie in the pit, finally arranged, faded, robbed of all prizes, while still under every human sky the crows wheel and swoop, Dividing, dividing the spoils of the dead.